everyone. Today we're going to talk about Bach's fugue number 5 in D major from the book 1 of his Well-Tempered Clavier. This fugue in four voices, although short, is a powerful and proud piece which assumes a special grandeur of its own because of its energetic demi-semi quaver run of the theme and the persistent dotting of the quaver. Unlike the other fugues we've discussed, this one needs only a short analysis. Before we begin, I just want to announce that I now have my Patreon page. The benefits per tier of being a patron are already sorted out in the page. This includes having a digital copy of my analysis, video lessons on analyzing, requesting a piece to analyze, and many more. I'll put the link to my Patreon page in the description. Also, please don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more videos like this. Let us now discuss the fugue. The subject appears first in the bass. The real answer, an exact transposition of the subject to the dominant, comes after it in the tenor. Please take note that this fugue has no regular counter subject. Before we move further, I'm going to divide the subject in three groups, A, B, and C. We will use their letter names for easier referencing for the later parts. At measure 3, there is a codetta of one bar preceding the entry of the subject in alto and is followed by the answer at measure 5. The exposition ends on the first beat of bar 6 after which comes another codetta containing allusions to the demi-semi-quaver figure of the subject. There is also a counter-exposition that is seen in measure 7 and 8. The subject appears again in the bass and the answer, which is now in B minor, is played by the soprano. The middle section of this fugue begins at measures 9 to 11 with the first episode. The semi-quaver figure seen in measure 9 is an augmentation of the last four demi-semi-quaver from the subject, and it's done in threefold repetition. On the last note of the phrase, the beginning of the subject is heard in the bass. Then, the passage is sequentially repeated a note lower. After which, a group of entries in G starts from measures 11 to 14 in a subject, answer, answer, subject order. It is followed by an isolated entry in E minor at measure 15, leading to a full cadence in the same key at measure 17. The second episode is a free inversion and an extension of the first. The semi-quavers, which were seen in the soprano in measure 9, are now in the bass. The harmony, like before, is a series of chords of the sixth descending by thirds. The sequence is then continued for another bar. At measure 20, the beginning of the subject is heard, as if in stretto, in all of the voices. The complete subject of this fugue is never heard again after measure 15. Therefore, it is difficult to decide with certainty where the final section of this fugue begins. I personally consider it to be at measure 23, after the full close in the tonic key. It is seen that measures 23 and 24 are built on repetitions of the first figure of the subject, while measures 25 to 27 are derived from repetitions on the last half of it, both by direct and contrary motion. Let's now listen to the whole fugue with the marks we put. 